bit nerve-wracking. George set up handmade films to finance Life of Brian, a company that would go on to make other feature films like Withnail and I and Mona Lisa. And so, several months later than planned, in September 1978, the 41-day shoot began in Tunisia. It was decided that Terry Jones should direct the film with Terry Gilliam in charge of art direction. This was a change from the Holy Grail film where both men had directed together, a situation that had caused some tension. The two Terriers had directed the Grail, and uh, it obviously drove them both mad. And so, which way should it go? Because Terry Gilliam is this brilliant look, and, you know, and then Jones is very, very good at getting the comedy on the screen. Terry Jones was the better comedy director of the two. I think Gilliam is great on anything visual, but I don't think he's as strong on narrative, and I don't think he's as funny as, as, as Terry Jones. So for me, it was I would have voted for Terry all the way down the line, and I don't remember any fights, I don't remember quite, but it was quite clear that if we could get Terry Gilliam to do the art direction, that was going to be superb. Terry was important to be the director because I would have got caught up in all sorts of detail that would have riled the others. And because you know, John didn't want to wear this, and then, you know, they, they, they didn't want to do all the things that I think are important to uh, film, wearing uncomfortable clothes, having you know, grotesque makeup, all of those things. Terry and I sort of fell out at one point. I think I said something rather stroppy to Terry at some point because I thought he was, he was <laughs> bending the cameraman's ear more, and I, went, and I was supposed I was to sort something out. Um, and it took Terry a long time to forgive me, I think. He didn't speak to me for quite a while. And Terry and I, I always thought we were very, very close. We are in most things. We love each other. I hadn't thought of that before now, but just thinking about it, he probably just kept out of my way because he was feeling so pissed off with me. I am convinced I've got a better visual sense than Terry. It's the only thing I'm better at. Everything else he's better at. It's one little area I'm, I'm pretty good at. And the first scene to shoot was the stoning sequence. So I think there was a feeling right from the beginning, and the very first scene I think that was shot was the stoning scene that this could be very funny indeed. And so morale was high. And so as a blasphemer! We, we were there on day one. And, 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 and Jonesy was so well prepared, it was shot like that. I suddenly thought, my God, this is fun. With Python, because we work and work and work on the script, the actual acting isn't very hard because you've rehearsed it all those times by reading it. So it's not like, so what do we do with the scene? You know, it's like it's pretty well established how that will play, what the cadences are, what the rhythms are. By lunchtime, I was in the pool. We'd finished the scene. The Pythons were keen that all should enjoy the shoot as much as possible, although there were some problems with this approach. When we arrived and it was all lovely, lovely late summer weather, by the Mediterranean, they said, uh, we've decided to let everybody have two hours at lunchtime, because it'll then they can go and have a decent meal, have a swim. And we thought, this is paradise. You know, we're in a holiday resort, and we're now being given two hours in the middle of the day. Of course, after three days, it was abolished, that theory, because the cameraman said that it, the surprisingly little amount of light each day, I mean, ended at about 5.30. He said, if I lose two hours in the middle of the day and my best time, we're never going to get anywhere. The good nature of the Pythons in trying to make us all have a good time for two hours, it just didn't, wasn't allowed to last very long. Lunch was cut to an hour, but the relaxed atmosphere continued. For me, it was a really happy suit. I kind of had the feeling that we were on the crest of a wave, that it was really working, everything was working. Um, so... Uh, yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a real breeze, actually. With about 70 cast and crew, the film unit needed a medic, and they found one in Graham Chapman, who had trained as a doctor many years before. On location, he was the doctor, and so he would play Brian, you know, the sort of er, Jesus, the healer, and in the mornings he would have surgery, and the evenings he'd have surgery. And he became the unit doctor, and this wonderfully wise man, puffing on his pipe and, and making sure everybody's bowels are all right and advising on sunburn and headaches and all this sort of thing. He took it really very seriously, so that having rushed around in his loincloth all day as Brian, he'd immediately get back to his surgery. Seventy people might be waiting for him to, to prescribe and hand out drugs and, you know, to, and it, it was something rather perfect about that. While the Pythons played multiple roles, 
They had also brought to Tunisia a small repertory company of actors to play a variety of characters. There was Terence Baylor, Charles McEwan, Andrew McLaughlin, Carol Cleveland, John Young, Gwen Taylor, Chris Langham, and Bernard McKenna. Hands up, all those who don't want to be crucified here. Kitus trailers, visit my oh, channel. Next! Midway through filming, in a bizarre coincidence, Spike Milligan, star of The Goon Show and a huge influence on all of the Pythons, suddenly popped up in Monastir. Spike happened to be in Tunisia because he was visiting um, the Second World War battlefields on which he'd fought. And he suddenly turns up in Monastir, can't get a room in a hotel because the entire Python team is there. Spike was invited to spend the day on the set and was also given a cameo. Yea, he cometh to us like the siege of the grave. But after lunch, when they were due to shoot Spike's close-up, he was nowhere to be found. Many of the scenes required huge crowds, and working with a large number of non-English speaking extras caused Terry Jones some challenges, especially for the filming of Willis Boyan. People of Jerusalem! It was our biggest crowd scene. We had 500 people there, and we thought, how are we going to get 500 people to laugh? So we, we got along this Tunisian comedian to sort of tell jokes and things, and uh, so he stood up there and was started telling jokes to them. I could see this wasn't working at all. They were just standing around there. Um, and so eventually I said to the, uh, the assistant director, the Tunisian assistant, uh, I said, can you tell the crowd to do what I do? So I just sort of burst into laughter, fell on the floor and rolled around waggling my legs in the air. And he said, do that. And of course the entire crowd fell on the floor laughing hysterically, waggling their legs in the air and the dust rose and it was just brilliant. But of course we weren't turning over. Ah, oh, it is so annoying, you know. And, and of course, then we had to get them to do it again. And it wasn't quite the same. It was never quite as funny as that first moment. The scene that would be the hardest to film would also be the most controversial, the crucifixion of Brian. Arriving there on the morning of the shoot and seeing all these crosses up on the horizon and... That was kind of a weird moment, and you kind of wondered quite how people would respond to that because, you know, the images were so strong. It's very chilling to go filming and find a cross with your name on it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, good. Um, and it was, it was kind of, you know, being up there for three days is quite philosophical. I think it, I would recommend it for people. Uh, I think anybody religious should, should try the experience because it's kind of interesting. You get a, an intriguing viewpoint. Four of us who tended to have chest problems uh, got really quite sick and I remember thinking the day I was crucified, you know, I wasn't looking forward to being crucified, but to be crucified when you got flu. It had taken the Pythons some time to come up with a fitting ending to the film. The decision to set the crucifixion to music was not taken lightly. We wondered whether we could finish with people on the cross and then suddenly we thought Yes, go for it. It felt right. And my recollection is that Eric came up with the song. We were trying to find an end, and everybody's on their way to be crucified. You know, this, this is the end. The plot is going this way. Everybody's been found guilty, and they're all going off to be crucified. How do you end the movie? And, and I think I said, well, it has to end with a song, clearly. And it, it has to be a cheery song, a cheery uppy song, and in fact, like a, a Disney song with a whistle. And I... I and everybody said, oh, yeah, that sounds kind of a funny idea. And I went straight home and I wrote it in about 20 minutes. And I can remember Eric singing this song to us, singing the, the end song to us. I wasn't over impressed by it, I have to say. <laughs> but we didn't have any other ending, so uh, and I thought it would be quite funny, the whole thing. <laughs> the idea that there should be a musical moment is, is, is a very nice conceit, and the idea that people will start singing and looking on... The, also the idea is looking on the bright side, when you have absolutely nothing to look forward to. Um, it really says something about the Brits. I always just thought it'd be funny having a song and dance routine on, on a cross. <laughs> it just seemed to be like a non-starter. You know, everybody's tied to this place. They can't move. That song is in the top ten of most requested songs at funerals and has been for 15 years. Isn't that weird and odd and strange and nice? That's the whole deal. When you come into the world, you're going to die. And if you don't like that... <laughs> 
<laughs> you kind of miss the point. Right? So I, I, I love all of that, and the, and, and the lyrics are very good, you know. It's very, very, it was a wonderful bit of work by Eric, that song, you know. So I think in a way we were all in our different ways working at our best. Certainly Gray was at his best as an actor. Uh, I was performing well, Eric was in good form. Um, uh, Michael was superb. Terry Gilliam made the film look good, and Terry Jones was absolutely on top of his game as a director. So it was just one of those moments when it all comes together, because usually in movies it all falls apart. The shoot was completed, and back in London, Terry Jones began to edit the film in preparation for Life of Brian's scheduled release a few months later. But unbeknownst to the Pythons, the secret was already out. There was a traitor within the ranks. Someone had sent 11 pages of the script to Mary Whitehouse and the Festival of Light. The Nationwide Festival of Light um, obtained the script from somewhere. I've, I've, no, I've no knowledge of that. That was all a bit before my time. Um, but nevertheless, the, the, the fact that they got the script means that somebody must have sent it to them that was associated with the film. Alarm bells are ringing at the Festival of Light. Somehow or other, they've got hold of 11 pages of script. It's actually the, the, the scene with the, the leper and so on. And they obviously don't like what they read, but they realise that if they go for this in a big way, then that may be counterproductive. So what they do is they adopt this kind of low profile, somewhat insidious campaign of saying, oh, let's all pray for the failure of Life of Brian. But praying was just the start of it. The Festival of Light then wrote a letter to the British Board of Film Censors, urging them to think of the consequences of allowing Life of Brian to be shown. It ended, I need not remind you of the wider implications of scurrilous abuse of God, Christ, or the Bible. The British Board of Film Censors, in turn, would not give the film a certificate unless they were confident that the film could not be successfully prosecuted for blasphemy. So the Pythons offered to take the film to John Mortimer for legal advice. They came to see me and I saw the film, which I thought riotously funny, and it remains one of my favourite funny films. Arms for an ex-leper! There was one rather dangerous point where Michael Palin was, uh, was a leper and he was cured by Jesus. And uh, he, said, he was very angry. He said, oh, bloody do-gooder, cured me. I can't beg anymore because I'm not a leper anymore. I think the opinion did recognise that it was dangerous, particularly dangerous in the aftermath of the gay news trial. They obviously were points which a prosecutor would make much of. But our advice about the whole film was really founded on telling the court that Brian and Jesus were two different people and that Jesus appears in the film as a separate character. Some of the censorship was done by the Pythons themselves, most significantly scenes involving a character called Otto. Hey, leader! What? Oh, I, I'm so sorry. Have you seen the new leader? The what? The new leader. I, I wish to find him and hail him. Lotto's are like a prototype fascist, really. I mean, he's, his, his view of, uh, of religion is he wants to, to, to purify his religion and get rid of the foreigners. In one particular scene, Otto talked to Brian about setting up a racially pure, all-Jewish community. Making it pure! No foreigners, no riffraff, no gypsies! This is terribly contentious because it's sort of suggesting that in extremes, Zionism can be compared to Nazism. And this rather extreme criticism was exacerbated by Gilliam taking the motto of uh, the, the, you know, the Star of David and making it into a sort of Nazi swastika, which immediately is very, very in your face. It's right on the edge. Again, you're saying things you're not supposed to say, this time not about Christians, but about Jews in Israel. Important stuff to say because it's, it, it's sort of cutting through the hypocrisy and it's saying the, saying the words you're not supposed to say. Also, Otto rather held up the action. So it was actually Eric Idle himself who decided that Otto, the Nazi, the Nazi Jew, uh, would go. Though it was, you know, in many ways sad, um, it, it was still not really what the film was about. It, it's a different film. I'm still not convinced cutting it out was the right thing, because I, I think that scene's really important. The only remnant in the finished film is Otto's very brief appearance with his Suicide Squad at Brian's crucifixion. Suicide Squad! Attack! Uh, 
that showed them, huh? Plans were also underway to publish the book of the film, but that too could be subject to a prosecution for blasphemy. The Pythons wanted again to publish a book based on the film. And I read the script and I thought it was absolutely marvellous. I thought this is really the Pythons masterpiece. It's a wonderful combination of satirical humour, crazy humour and serious metaphysical humour. Some cuts were suggested that would ensure safe publication. The Pythons considered them and Michael Palin called Geoffrey Strawn at Methwin. The answer came back to me in, in, in the most civil possible way from Michael Palin who gave me a ring. He said, look, we've talked about it. We don't want to make any changes. We don't think that this film is offensive to any living individual. We stand by it and, and that's our last word. So I went to my chairman, the chairman of Air Methuen, and to the boss of Associated Book Publishers, and I said, look, I think this is a wonderful film. I don't think it's in any way unpleasant or offensive. This is the Python's decision. We cannot cave in to Mary Whitehouse. They, so they said, OK, go ahead. The only proviso was that if somebody had to go to prison, it would be me. So I agreed to that. For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow. Life of Brian was completed. The Pythons set out for America. It had been decided to open the film there first, home as it was to freedom of speech, the Constitution, and perhaps even more helpfully, not home to any blasphemy laws. The world premiere was set for New York on August the 17th, 1979. The reviews were positive for the most part, People were kind of whoa, you know. I mean, not in a bad, not a bad way, but just they were kind of, uh, kind of uh, surprised, impressed at the audacity of the film to go there and to try this kind of stuff. And some of them were even delivered in keeping with the film itself. Ye who would not see the Bible satirized, stay thee at home. And ye who would smile at biblical buffoonery, hie thee hence to a theater nearest you. Just knowest beforehand what thou art getting into. Therefore sayest not that thou were not warned and others will be saved from your gripes of wrath. And the first gripes of wrath came from probably the least expected place, when Rabbi Abraham Hecht described the film as being blasphemous, sacrilegious, and an incitement to possible violence. Well, it seemed odd when the film came out that the, the first group to complain about it uh, was the, a group that we'd never <laughs> imagined would want to have anything to complain about at all. And that was the, uh, I think it was the New York Association of Rabbis. And we thought, well, why are they complaining? Um, I can imagine Christians complaining, but not rabbis. Um, and anyway, they were complaining about the use of the, the prayer, well, prayer shawl in the, in the stoning sequence, which you know, we didn't know it was the prayer shawl. We just thought it was a bit of costume, you know. So evidently we were making, uh, making light of that. So, so when you're treading on delicate ground, you never know what you're going to be, <laughs> who you're going to be offending. In a rare piece of church unity, religious groups banded together to protest about Life of Brian. Here in Variety magazine.